This is Making Comics 101, issue 17, sound effects and logo design. <laughs> Greetings people of the internet, I'm Scott with Cirkworks Art Labs. Welcome mad creators to the underground laboratory where together we're going to create some awesome comics because this is Making Comics 101. This is issue 17 where we're going to talk about sound effects and logo design. Now originally... These two topics were going to belong in different issues. For instance, the sound effects I was going to tie into the lettering episode and the logo design was going to go to the cover episode, which will probably be next week. But I, I thought that these kind of fit together well on their own and I just thought it would make more sense to spend maybe a little more time on them. So let's talk a little bit about sound effects. So what I refer to as sound effects in comics is... Uh, I, w I was going to say more generally known, but probably not generally known, but the, the actual term for it is onomatopoeia. Now, don't ask me how to spell that, although it probably did appear here in, in, in the video. So basically, onomatopoeia is the visual representation of a sound, and that's what sound effects. Now, sound effects, sometimes sound effects, I call them sound effects. Some people, when you say sound effects, as they're thinking of like movie sound effects, like actual sounds you can hear. Now, obviously, when we're reading comic books, we don't really hear sounds, but we're trying to convey that. So we're trying to take sounds and give them, like I said, a visual representation. There's all kinds of different onomatopoeia that can be used. For instance, there's machine sounds, which is like a whirring sound or like a clunking sound or something like that. We've got animal sounds like, a, you know, a cock-a-doodle-doo or a roar or a purr. We've got impact sounds like a thumb or a crash or a boom. There's voice sounds like something that a person would say like, like a, a giggle or a whisper or a murmur and there's nature sounds like a rustling or a splash. So there's all kinds of different categories but basically what it comes down to is anytime you are trying to convey a noise visually and that's what we're going to talk about today. So creating sound effects for comics is one of these areas that I really get into. I mean I nerd out about it like crazy. So and I've done a lot of comic book sound effects in some of the products that I put out like the Comic Maker Toolkit, Comic Maker Starter Kit available for free at CircWorks.com. Uh, there are sound effects included in there that you can use in your own comics but I'm constantly I, I constantly play around with sound effects. I, I mean, I draw out sound effects. You can see, I, or maybe you can't because this is like blue line. But usually, you know, I'll do these by hand and then I'll take them into Illustrator and I'll, you know, and that's how I create sound effects. So I'm always looking for interesting ways to introduce sounds in my comics. And it is just fun to play with because whereas in most cases, like when I talked about lettering, there were a lot of, you know, there were some rules and things. Sound effects, sometimes you can throw a lot of those rules out the window. We don't have to worry so much about correct spelling. All these words, a lot of some of them, they're just phonetically spelled or sounded out. Uh, and it's just fun to just play around. And just imagine how that sound can appear visually, you know, and translate onto the page and really make an impact. I mean, that's the great thing about sound effects is that they can be so, you know, bombastic. They just say so much. And it's really another one of those unique areas that you don't see a lot uh, in other mediums. It's pretty specific to comics. Uh, you, I mean, sometimes they'll translate that in the, like the old Batman series which was based on a comic. They would have the pow and the bam and the boom when they're fighting and everything. Uh, but typically you're not going to see that in movies because you ha actually can use real sound effects whereas we can't. There's no, It's not an audio medium so we have to get a little creative and that's the whole idea and I think that's what makes it so fun for me is just it allows us to be creative and kind of come up with these unique maybe even unorthodox ideas of of how sounds can be represented. So keep in mind how your sound is going to look. The way you represent that sound has to match what the sound is. For instance, take these two sounds. You've got a sound like a splash and a crash. Those should not, you should not be able to interchange the way those look. A splash is gonna be a lot more, you know, rounded edges and free flowing, whereas a crash sound is gonna be more bold, blocky type letters, possibly, maybe, things are a little you know haphazard and everything like that so how you render those sound effects has everything to do with the type of sound that it is and it has to be particular to the type of sounds we have all kinds of different sounds you know and the way we show those are going to be different and as i mentioned there's really no rule as far as spelling and you don't even have to for instance you don't have to have crash you can make up your own words like 
you know, how does that, you make a, how do you spell that? I don't know. You have to kind of sound things out. Maybe it's with K, maybe it's with a C, maybe a C U, you know, C K or something like that. I don't know. I mean, you can kind of, or C H or, it really doesn't matter. It's just how you want to put it together in your mind. There aren't any rules when it comes to that type of thing, but it is fun sometimes not to just use your, like a splash or a crash or a boom, but come up with something unique and interesting that people haven't seen before. And you can get away with that in comics because it's just you're just representing that sound. So just sound it out and realize that it's just all subjective. There's no right or wrong way to do this. And if you have a little fun with it, you're gonna, you're gonna come up with some really cool sound effects. Think about the size and the shape of your sound effects. For instance, if you wanna illustrate boom, I mean, that's a big sound effect. That's gonna take up a lot of space as opposed to something that's like a, like a clicking sound. You don't want like a click to be like, a click is just a little sound. You don't, you don't want a big, you know, take up the whole page with just click, whereas a boom, it can be. And, and not only the size, but also the shape. For instance, boom, it can, and it doesn't even have to be B-O-O-M. It can be B-O-O-O-O-O-M. And then, and some of the O's can be larger than others. It could be boom or something like that. We can take those vowels, we can stretch them out, get a feel for how that shape will move across the page. And sound effects can trail off. They can start off big and, and get small or vice versa. If something's building and building and getting bigger, we can start small and we can get bigger. There's really just so many possibilities when it comes to designing your sound effects. And like I said, I design a lot of sound effects because sound effects are one of my favorite parts of the comic book process. I do a lot of them and I also like to create things for other artists to use. I'll show you, and this will just give you some examples of different sound effects, what they might look like without all the artwork and everything on it. But this is Make Your Own Comics. This is my series of books they're available on Amazon but you know you've got panel pages I put some sound up this one has sound effects built into it so you've got you know boom buzz bam wham wham pow zap so all this stuff and then you've got some smaller sound effects like I was mentioning like a squeak sound obviously you're not gonna put squeak with this big giant kind of crackly sound effects it's gonna be it's gonna be more rounded and small same thing with the click here smash rip no with this book I, I purposely wanted to make some basic sound effects but like I said you don't have to instead of just going with a roar you don't have to write roar out you can go and, and just figure out how that spells out I know it's it, I know it's kind of silly but but this is the kind of stuff I do when I'm creating sound effects and manga is super huge for sound effects you'll you'll find I think proportionally manga has way more sound effects they find ways to do all these different shorthands stuff we don't even do here in in the Western world. So I've got like, I've also got like make your own manga. And the interesting thing about this one is it, it is Japanese sound effects on one side and on the other side, it's it's in English. So, so here where you've got, you've got boom. And then on the opposite page, you've got boom in Japanese. But these are just examples of what some comic book sound effects can look like. And you know, they all start off from here. I like to work traditionally and then scan this stuff in. So whether you can see this or not, it's blue line. But these are some of those actual, I don't know, I find that I, find that I get, a, I can be a little more loose because that's all sound effects are. You want it to look more organic. You don't want it to look stiff. So I always start doing these in pencil and then I go into the computer and I trace over them in Illustrator. And it helps to just practice your lettering. These these are a little more bold sound effects. This wouldn't necessarily be something you would see in the body copy or the dialogue of a comic book, but they make great sound effects. And this is sort of a sign painter style, but you can take this and you can chip away at it and it makes an awesome, you know, it makes awesome sound effects. Believe it or not, I, I just use these cheap Crayola markers. Now I wouldn't use these for anything that's going to be reproduced because they're not light fast or anything, but just for doing the sketching for the initial sketches. They've got sort of a chisel tip on it. You know, that's basically what I used for this. So, and you can play around with different tools or whatever when you're creating your sound effects. And there's so many interesting ways you can use sound effects as a storytelling device. For instance, so here's, this is my comic, Young and the Dead. Uh, so I'm using this, in this particular instance, I'm using a transition from one scene to a next where Right here, we've got these characters, they're, they've got this little time capsule in this coffee cup, and they're up in a treehouse, so they're gonna basically bury this time capsule, this, this coffee can, in the floorboard of a treehouse, 
And so you hear, he's got the hammer, you hear this thunk, thunk sound, the sound of the hammer. But then here you go, and we're transitioning the scene. We, we, we end with thunk, thunk, and now we're in a new scene. The same character is sleeping, you hear thunk, thunk, and what basically what it is, it's somebody knocking at his door. So it, you, can, you can use sound effects as sort of a transition from scene to scene. That's one thing to do. You can also use sound effects as a panel. Here's an example from, this is uh, The Front by Jersey Droz. If you're not familiar with Jersey Droz, he was part of the Art and Story podcast, and he's still doing his thing. I mean, he is a scholar of comics, he teaches comics, and this book, I don't even know if he still publishes this one, I know he's doing some different stuff, but this, this particular book is almost like his, he, when he designed this, I remember him saying how he wanted to try all these different techniques out and put them all into action and really play around with the comics medium. And one of the things that I found that he did a lot in this book is to use, he used uh, sound effects as panels. So as you can see right here, you've got this walk, walk, walk. And, and you see the character in here. So it's actually a panel that he's, he's taken a sound effect and built a panel out of. Here's another one here. He's got another sort of sound effect panel that he's created. And this goes back to what I was talking about before with uh, using unusual pronunciations or spelling. So it's T-H-D-S-H. -H. So the dish. So what is that? The dish? I don't know. But it... But he just, he's really good at this and it kind of goes throughout the book. He does this technique quite a bit. Another famous artist that is incredible for using unique typography, lettering, and sound effects is Will Eisner. Uh, I've got an example here. Look at, this is amazing. We've got the character, he's kind of looking through the type and we see all these bodies strewn about through here. So it's, not only is it a logo, and not only is it type, is it a sound effect, but we're kind of moving through it as a story. Uh, and it's just brilliant and his books are just filled with this kind of stuff and there's a lot of interesting things you can do with sound effects even in lieu of something that's not going on in the artwork for instance you can have like a sound effect building before you actually see visually what that is like if you hear if you've got characters in there maybe they're detectives in there they're or they're investigating something and they're hearing this chomping sound this chomping sound and you don't see what it is but you hear that sound effect and it's building and it's building and it's building and finally they get in and discover exactly what it is and maybe it's some crazy crazy monster feeding on something or whatever but you know the sound effects don't actually have to represent what you're seeing right there on the page they could be something that's either coming up or trailing off or whatever I mean this that, you can see I'm nerding out about this because I love I, I love all of the possibilities that you can use when it comes to sound creating sound effects so before we wrap up this section on sound effects there is something that I want to bring to your attention and it's something that's highly debated among people doing sound effects and that is when you're doing a sound effect you put exclamation points on them i've been sort of on both sides of the coin lately i'm learning leaning more towards you know no you don't need to because it to me it just comes to me it just stands to reason that if it's a big if it's a bold sound effect that you just know that it's an exclamation you don't really need to put that but i have seen like here again if you look back at the the front Pretty much every single one of his sound effects has an exclamation point. So, you know, that's that can vary different from artist to artist. Some people prefer to put that exclamation point on their sound effects, some don't. But I just wanted to put, put that out there because I don't know if that's been decided as what the right way to do it, but there are people that debate about that. So it's just something you should know about. So something that goes hand in hand with sound effects are logo designs. And this is going to kind of lead into next week's topic, which is gonna be cover designs. So we're gonna kind of preface this because there's so much to talk about when it comes to cover design. But I wanna talk a little bit about designing logos for comics. Now, logo designs for comics typically, not always, but typically has a really bold aesthetic to it. You usually don't wanna to go too fancy with it so it's not legible or hard to read. Uh, example, so this, this uh, is from my friend Joshua Kimbo who do the art casters with just brilliant layout and everything but it's very ornate and it may not work on a comic even though he is doing a comic it's more of an untraditional comic uh, I don't know if something like this is actually what he'll have on the on his logo design but in most cases when we're looking on the shelves of comics we're gonna get stuff that's a little more you know like this where, where it's got the drop shadow or that 3d effect and one of the things that I like to compare comic book logos to are like soda pop logos so if you've seen like mountain dew or you know any number these dr pepper seven up all these different uh, soda logos you'll notice that 
they're usually all the same co they constantly change okay but they're always usually the same color scheme and when they do change it's only slightly that they changed more over time they'll they, you can see more of a change but they're constantly switching them up and everything and changing them and giving new iterations but they always have something similar for instance i showed this daredevil um and then this is you know this is probably, I don't know, this is probably not the current, but there's still some similarities there. But there's other examples. For instance, the Hulk. The Hulk is always going to be a bold, you know, rock kind of looking font like, like this. You're not going to see the Hulk in long, slender letters. It just, it doesn't work for, for, for this particular character in this particular book, you know. But, you know, it's constantly changing, but it's still going to be that bold block letters. Spider-Man. Spider-Man usually always has a bit of an arch to his logo. This is an older one. Uh, then, again, we kind of see where we've still got that arch to Spider-Man. And it varies from title to title. There's other... This is, you know, sort of a Spider-Man or Amazing Spider-Man. Sometimes they'll switch it up a little bit. But you can see, I think this is, uh, this is definitely more current. But they're still using that same look because once you've established a look for your comic, you know, people come to expect that. And they, when they look at that, they want to instantly recognize that, that yeah, that's Spider-Man or that's the X-Men or Batman or whatever. Although the logos typically will change, they don't change a whole lot. Uh, usually keeping the same color scheme. Uh, there's some element in them that, that that kind of still is representative throughout the changes in the logo. And every once in a while, they will somebody will switch something up that it's a little bit jarring. I, I remember the, so the first comic book that I started collecting. The thing that really got me into comics was Alpha Flight. But this was what really got me into comic back when John Byrne was doing it, the first series. And so this was the logo they went with. And you know, I'm reading this comic. I just come to know this this logo and in this case they didn't just change it slightly they went with a drastic look so at, at some point this uh, logo similar to this just kind of popped up and I'm like whoa I, I didn't even recognize it as the same comic because you know you're looking through comics the the first thing you're drawn to a lot of times is that logo and when you change it drastically like this I remember when this came out I was like I do not like that at all why did they change it and then it kind of grew on me and now I can kind of see at, you know as somebody who understands type and everything that this is a nice logo it's very different but then you never know this is the this is I, I think this is the most recent uh, Alpha Flight special that came out and they kind of went back to the original so but I think with a book like Alpha Flight where it probably wasn't that much of a bestseller especially at this time sometimes people do drastic things to try to breathe new light into it and that's when you get more of a, a more drastic change like this but in the most in most cases you know the logos will kind of remain the same throughout because logos are all about branding and building awareness of your book or whatever your product is. Once you establish that, you, you want it to be something that people instantly make a connection to and say, oh yeah, that's cool. And like I said, with comic books, you've got a lot of these bold three-dimensional type effects logos. And, and that's just, that's been fairly typical with comics. But lately I'm starting to see some interesting changes. Whereas for instance, here is Oblivion song this is a Robert Kirkman book uh, and I mean I just when I saw this I mean part of what what got me into wanting to collect this comic was this just this logo design I mean it's a great logo design and it is not three-dimensional it doesn't even have outlines or anything it's just a solid logo and this logo would not work if it was with any other background so it's got to kind of play with the with the cover design as well and I, like I said we'll get into covers more next week but you can see if they're you know we've got sort of a limited color palette on this where we can get away with having uh, just this solid logo without any outlines or anything like that. But the design of this is really striking and it, it, it makes it kind of stand out. Here's sort of another example. This is uh, Void Walker. This is uh, an alternate title. And again, I really love this logo. I like how the the some letters are bigger. They kind of come across. The L kind of comes down. I mean, it's just really interesting the way all that type is laid out and everything. And because of this background, we can get away with this solid white logo. Uh, now, that's not always the case with this. If you can look with uh, the next issue, you'll notice 
the cover has got a lot more detail and that just white logo might get lost in there. So what they did was they did go ahead and drop that shadow. And, and a lot of times you will see that happen, whereas the first issue, they, they kind of introduce a little bit of a stylistic thing. And then in the second issue, they'll go and they'll maybe change it slightly or whatever moving forward. Here's some good examples of that. So this is the Falcon miniseries, uh, very striking cover. And part of that is, uh, you know, you've, against the brick wall, so you're kind of seeing the Falcon in graffiti. Even the typography up here of the limited series is also looks like it's maybe done in graffiti. But this isn't the logo that they use moving forward. This was sort of just for this first issue. And as they went on, uh, they went with this logo. This idea of introducing one particular style of logo and then changing it up. And that could be a problem because what you're trying to do is you're building recognition. And usually first issues sell more. So if people are expecting to look for the Falcon 2 and it's it doesn't have this type of logo, it could be a problem. Them, but I noticed I noticed them doing this quite a bit. For instance, here's a good example of you know an X-Men title, X-Men that's actually worked into the illustration. Uh, this was for the first issue, uh, or maybe this is this is actually a variant issue, I believe. And then on the other ones, we've got sort of the standard X-Men logo, but something they did something a little different for this variant issue. Another example in that same vein is this uh, Man of Steel miniseries by John Byrne. Uh, you can see Man of Steel, it's actually done in sort of a, like a silver font. It looks like, like a spot color or something that they put over this, but very bold, you know, Man of Steel, and they've got this iconic, you know, him opening the, the shirt with the S and everything. So you definitely know it's Superman without even saying Superman. On the second issue, again, we kind of switched it up a little bit. And you can see why in this particular case, because maybe they designed this logo right here with the S and the Man of Steel. But the problem is, because I think, again, you're, you're trying to sell this, and of course you're gonna have the picture of Superman here, so you're gonna know it's Superman, but I think they really probably wanted that S. Now we've already got it here, so it's probably not gonna make sense if we were to use a logo like this with the S and then it just having repeated here. So you can see in certain situations, you may need to change your logo around. And once we get into cover design, we'll start talking. I mean, a logo can be so iconic that like, for instance, in this case, we know the X-Men logo. I mean, here it's almost, completely, I mean, most of that logo is obscured by a storm here, but we still know that's the X-Men logo because it's so familiar to us. So that's a big part of designing logos and branding and everything and creating something that's iconic that people recognize. And that's what it comes down to in designing a, a really good logo for your comic. So anyway, yeah, that's, I mean, I can go on and talk about logos forever because I love logos. I love sound effect design. But I just wanted to put all this information out here for you guys to think about. We'll dive a little deeper into some of the sound effects and logo designs and all that stuff uh, later on this week. But that's going to do it for this week, and I'll see you guys later. That is all. Hey, thanks for watching. If you like what you saw and you want to see more, hit that subscribe button. Also, you can follow me at Surfworks on social media, and now you can support the work that I do on Patreon. Do you like making comics? Then go to Surfworks.com and pick up the Comic Maker Starter Kit. It's packed full of fonts, brushes, templates, and more. And best of all, it's totally free.